here to see all of you and to give hugs and high fives and all that type of thing. Uh, as we jump into uh, our the Bible this morning, we're, we're ending up a series that began a long time ago on the book of Romans. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Romans chapter 16, it's page 814, if you're using the Bible that's here near you, or if you're using your phone or your iPad or something like that, just open it up. Um, has anybody here heard uh, the uh, acronym uh, KISS, KISS, right? You know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, before I went on vacation, sometime, probably, I think it was about in May or June, somewhere in there, I started getting all of these emails. And there was all these emails from anybody who I'd ever signed up and done anything with, right? Uh, and it was the updated terms of service. Does anybody, does that ring a bell to anybody, you know, updated terms of service? And so I kept wondering, why am I getting all of these notifications of updated terms of service? And so I did a little, you know, Google search on it, like, you know, what's going on, and came to find out that uh, the uh, Europeans had changed their law to protect the privacy of consumers. And that was impacting and affecting everybody in the world because it's sort of this worldwide economy thing, particularly when it comes to the internet uh, and your stuff goes all over the place. So everybody was updating their you know, legal documents to protect themselves and to make them fit within this new laws that were going on. So they were sending out these updated terms of service and um, of, of which you read all of them as well as I did, right? You know, you clicked on their read more and it, it was 0.54 font, right? Um, and about 30 pages of it with uh, occasional bolded sentences, right? It's like, uh, has anybody ever bought a house, a piece of property? Okay. Like when you read fully your contract when you bought your house, right? No, you, you know, your realtor says, sign it down there. It's like, oh, I'm going to read this. You have, how many pages do we have? You have 50 more pages to go. Okay. What's the next page? You know, you just, you just sort of push it, push it through. So in, in, so I, I know that you are a little bit concerned about what was in those documents. So let me assure you, this is what it said, okay? We will not sell your information to the Russians, the Chinese, or your neighbor, period. That's what it was about. That was, that was all, uh, you know, and it was this. You see, what I did is, is that I did the KISS principle. Keep it simple, sparky. All right? Okay. Some of you are saying stupid. Some of you said stupid. We're in a church. Come on, be nice to one another, okay? That's not very nice. Everybody here is brilliant in this room, by the way. So keep it, keep it, keep it simple, Sparky. I mean, sometimes we want to know, okay, what is it that we're all about? As we come to the end of the book of Romans, and we've come through this letter, which is one of Paul's most amazing letters where he's written and, and, and helped us to understand life together and life um, in the church and how do we relate to God and Jesus and how do we relate across cultures. I mean, there's all kinds of things that Paul has is, is talked about is that at the bottom line is sort of there is this keep it simple, sparky element that we want to pay attention to. Now, in Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, let me read to you what he writes here. He said, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Now, underline what Paul is, is writing here and what we're looking at today as we come to this, the very end of his letter is this kiss principle. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. At the bottom line of what Paul is going to come to here is, is that remember, as we talk about these things, that it's always ultimately about Jesus. Who he is, what he did, and what he is doing. It's always about Jesus. Keep Jesus at the center. Keep Jesus central. One of the phrases that I talked about has been meaningful to me for many years is this idea of love Jesus most. Keep it simple, sparky. <laughs> is that keep Jesus at the center? 
And when we began this whole journey together of looking at what Paul was writing to us and helping us to understand about Jesus and God in his letter to the Roman church, in Romans 1, 16 and 17, it says, pay attention to this, keep this central, because this, is, this summarizes everything he's going to be writing. And in Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, the name Jesus, the word Jesus, isn't in verses 16 and 17, but everywhere underlined through those words is Jesus, because Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the gospel. What who he is, what he has done, and what he is doing. And Paul is saying, keep it at the center. Always remember, Jesus, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That's everything I'm going to be writing to you about, and now we're coming to the end. And as we come to this section, uh, Paul is giving a bit of a, a red flag warning. Now, we live in California, so you probably have heard that phrase, red flag warning. The National Weather Service has this thing called the red flag warning, that when um, there's low relative humidity, there is high winds, there is lots of dry fuel, and there's a potential for dry uh, lightning strikes or any combination of those things, then it is extraordinarily dangerous for fire. You know what we're talking. You know what I'm talking about. That's the conditions that we are living under right now in our community in the state of California. Red flag warning. In, in other words, be very careful. There, there is great danger. And Paul is giving this red flag warning here. He's saying, "Okay, be very careful. There's great danger." I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive the hearts of the naive. He's saying, listen, okay, I've given you this truth, but there's, there's, this, there's this potential of division and obstacles that are going to come your way. And when you see those divisions and those obstacles, you need to know that it then has not been about Jesus because that's not what Jesus is about. And so I'm warning you of this. And your best defense against this is, is that you would know the truth. The word he uses there is doctrine, right? So probably in this past week, I would guess that you didn't use the word doctrine once. Hey, how's your doctrine doing today? Man, my doctrine's doing really good, feeling good about my doctrine. Everything's good about my doctrine. All right, great. That's good doctrine. And somebody's like standing next to you in the grocery line, they're going, those people are weird, right? What's up with that? So doctrine is sort of a church word, a religious word, but really ultimately what it means is it means truth. And Paul is saying, listen, I've taught you doctrine. I've, I've, I've been teaching you, as, as I've been writing this letter, doctrine. I've been teaching you truth about what is truth and what is true. And so our best defense against in this red flag warning time against these divisions and these obstacles is that we would know the truth, that we would know Jesus. That we would know who Jesus is what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing, that we would keep Jesus central. And Paul makes it really clear is, is that when you see something that, that doesn't align, then what you need to do is you need to step away, that you need to avoid them. And he's talking about people. There will be people who will come in who will try to, to convince you of different and false views. He says, avoid them. Step away from them, and, and you need to listen. As we do that, we need to listen to our head and to our heart and to our gut when we're going, hey, you know, something doesn't seem to be lining up here. Now, here's something I want to say, and this is really important, really critical, is that sometimes we can have a disagreement with the church, and, and, and the way that I view churches is this, is that churches are like people. They have personalities, Right? And, and so if you're new to Cold Springs Church, one of the things is you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out what's the personality of this group of people and is this a place that, that I fit? 
Um, and, and we go to another church, and another church has different personalities. And this is what I believe, is that God raises up different churches with different leaders, with different personalities as a church. And they may even have a different emphasis or focus, but they're all still centered in Jesus. They're just different because we're all different, and there are different people within this community that God wants to reach. And so he raises up sort of unique expressions of his group of people, of his church. And that's okay. Okay. You can just say, well, you know what? That's not the place that I feel like I can grow best and I can serve best. Those are the two things that we need to look at. Is that not, it's not all about us. It's how can we serve as well. But where can I grow and where can I serve? That's not what Paul is talking about here, okay? Not, not talking about some of these differences of personalities within church. He's talking about that where truth has been compromised, and we need to listen if, if we're feeling like things are, are off. And the, the way that we can tell is, is that when we look at the leadership, that there's motivations and manipulations that are underlying what is happening. And the, the number one motivation is looking at a, a leader who serves himself. And you can always look at the, the fruit and you can really tell what is going on. You can look at the fruit of a group of people, or you can look at the fruit of a, a particular person, and you get a really good idea of, of what is at the heart of what's going on. Uh, it was interesting, you know, I, I'm a news junkie, and so I'm always, you know, looking at news headlines and, and looking at what's going on. And it was interesting here within the last couple of months that the Catholic Church came out with this really strong stance against prosperity gospel preachers. Uh, as, as being um, uh, uh, undermining the, the Christian faith. And th they're right on within this. This idea, the prosperity gospel preaching, uh, which says that, in essence, is that God owes you a great life. And that great life is you're going to have plenty of money and you're going to have plenty of happiness because all of your circumstances are going to work out right. God owes you. And the way for you to get that, by the way, is to give me money. And so recently, one of, one of these guys, uh, his conviction was is that God had blessed his ministry and he needed to better serve the world through his ministry. And so he already had either one or two private jets, but he needed the newest private jet in order to effectively and efficiently carry out his ministry. I thought about sharing that with you this morning of some of the things that I'm, you know, doing and uh, be great to do, but my wife wouldn't let me. Um, so um, I talked with her. She said, no, ride your bike to church this morning, David. Um, Self-serving. When, when, it, when it's about self, it, it, you have to, to, to step back. And the other thing is, is this appetite driven. It says, you know, the, their appetites are never complete. They're never full. I need the newest. I need, the, I, I need the, this, this greatest. He says, watch those motivations and those manipulations. And here's, here's the thought that I had. It says, you know, if you listen to a snake long enough, you, you think it sounds like a saint. You, you think it, it, sounds, it sounds good, and, and this is the problem with when we isolate ourselves and we isolate our beliefs, is that you can convince yourself that anything is true if you give yourself long enough. You can manipulate your thinking and, and things enough that you can turn the world upside down and not in the good way. And that's why we stay connected to community. That's why we stay connected to God's word because it, there's a correction that is constantly taking place. And if you haven't been offended by somebody in the community or offended by, by God's word, then you probably aren't paying close enough attention because we're all in the process and journey of growing and, and being like Jesus. It, it, and so so the, the advice, the practical advice that Paul gives is, is hey, Continue in your obedience. Be, be an obedient people. Look at verse uh, 19. He says, For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Don't, don't lose your obedience. And, and here's the thing, as, as Paul talks about this, is he's giving them a shout-out, saying, Hey, you've been Roman church. You've been really good 
about your obedience. You've been really good about living this life of obedience, of, of, of knowing what God wants and who he is, and then following, following through with it. And it's a foundational thing for us in our life. In fact, um, parents, uh, any parents here? Okay. Any kids here? Kids of parents? All right. That would be all of you, by the way, just so you know. It, it was a trick question, just making sure you're paying attention. Okay. So as you're parenting your kids, one of the things as you're parenting them is, is that you want them to have a compliant heart and an obedient spirit. This is that they would do what, they, what you ask them to do when you would do it and that it wouldn't come with a whole lot of attitude um, in that process. And, and it's, it can be a challenge to do it. And as a kid, we think our world is being squashed. You know, we're being controlled. But if from a parental experience, um, perspective, let me tell you, kids, what's going on, is, is that parents believe that if you will do what they say in the way that they say it, that it will lead to the best life possible. Now, parents aren't always right. Let's get that right. I mean, we mess up. We need forgiveness. We need repentance at times too. But at the heart of parents is that if you would do what I ask you to do when I ask you to do it, it's going to lead to a blessing, to the best life possible. And that's what Paul is teaching here to his spiritual children, to you and I, saying, listen, this is how, this is your heavenly father said, this is the way to live. Do it in obedience with a compliant heart because I want you to have the best life possible. And how often as we, when we get to be an adult, we forget or we ignore this idea of obedience, that none of us ever stops being invited to live in obedience. And we have a heavenly father who loves us deeply, passionately, wants the best for us. And Paul says, your obedience is known to all. Good job. Continue in that because that's the pathway to the best life possible. And so this is, this is how you do it. So this, is, this will help. Very practical. He says two things that you need to focus on. One is major on the good. Major on the good. And this comes back to who is Jesus? What has Jesus done? Who is Jesus? What is Jesus doing? And, and live out of the overflow of trusting Jesus in your life. And that, that as you come to questions or you come to challenges, turn to Jesus. Ask Jesus, Jesus, give me direction leading in my life and live out of trusting Jesus because Jesus will lead you into the good, to focus on the good. And more Jesus never hurts <laughs> and it always helps. So we invite Jesus into that. We focus on the good. And, and focusing on the good means that we are aware of the, the things that are coming into our life because that's the opposite side of what Paul talks about here is, is that we're also to guard against the evil. To guard against the evil. Now, on one of the things I did um, backpack, uh, or during my vacation is something I do every summer. There's a group of guys who will go backpacking up in the Desolation Wilderness area. And one of the guys I go with uh, is a fly fisherman, great fly fisherman, Matt Smith, I think his grandfather taught him to fly fish, and so he loves getting up there into the mountain, you know, these mountain lakes. And I've only been fly fishing a couple, for a couple of years. I'm not good at it, right? You know, it's like, choo, choo, nothing's happening. It's like, I'm going to go get in the hammock and read, right? You know, so I'm going to yeah, work on my suntan. But then I'll look over at Matt, and Matt's like out there at the lake, you know, for like a couple of hours. I'll look, and he's, you know, he's doing something, and he's not fishing. It doesn't look like he's fishing. He's doing something, and what he's doing is he's trying a different fly because the one he was using, the the fish aren't biting on, so he's trying another one. Then he'll come back to camp and he'll say, man, you know, they weren't biting on this or this, but man, I found this one. This is really biting on this. And I'm like, yeah, they weren't biting on anything in the hammock. You know, I don't know what's going on. But what, what he, he is, is he's a good fisherman that he knows that the, the fish are going to bite on certain baits. Now, there's another good fisherman in the, in the spiritual realm and that good fisherman in the spiritual realm is Satan. And Satan knows the bait that you will bite on. 
I don't know if you are familiar with this, the phrase. If you're younger, you definitely are familiar with the phrase clickbait. So if you're online, you're uh, on a, a website, or you're on a news feed or something like that, all of a sudden these things will pop up. And they'll usually revolve around um, a, a woman who's scantily clad um, or something that you have looked up at some other point online that has tracked you and said, here's something for you to buy or here's something for you to check out. And what it's doing is, is it inviting you to click on it and to follow the path down that line. It's click bait. It's a bait for you to not exercise self-control and not do what you intended to go do, but to follow their path. That's what Satan does in our life. And it revolves pretty much around the seven deadly sins. I mean, we could go through it, and you could find all of those things on the Internet at some point of an invitation for you to click on that. And what Paul is saying is be, in, be innocent. Be innocent towards those things. Don't do it. Don't go down those paths. I wonder what that word means. I wonder where that website goes. I wonder what that's about. If you begin to wonder like that, you're probably going down a path of not of innocence, but of exposure to evil. See, because it's a battlefield. You and I live in a battlefield, and that's where Paul comes to. In verse 20, he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. There's a couple of things that just really sort of struck me as odd when I read that first time. First off, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. It's like, God of peace, crushing. Peace and crushing. Usually, you know, I haven't put those two together very often, right? You know, you, see, you don't see those. It's like the, the God of war will crush, you know. Say, no, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. You're, you and I, were in a battle, spiritual battle. But did you, did you notice that what Paul said there? He didn't say the God of peace will crush Satan under his feet. He says the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. That whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever battle you're a part of, in trusting Jesus and following Jesus, Satan will be under your feet through the power and the grace of Jesus. That is an amazing, powerful promise to you. Through God, your feet will stand on Satan. Amazing. And in the spiritual battle that you're living, you are not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to do it by yourself. Don't be alone. And this is at the, the end. He, um, he comes here in chapter 15. He, uh, if you were here, Ben Weissong, our worship pastor, his dad, um, came and preached through that, and it was all of these names. He went through all these names. And Paul comes back to these, uh, some names here. And it's just it's a reminder that Paul wasn't alone. So these are the people who are hanging out with Paul. It says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So Timothy was the guy that Paul was going to hand off his ministry to. He knew he was going to die. Um, he was going to be martyred for the faith. And, and he had somebody behind him. And it was Timothy. And he's training him and developing him. So to Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, uh, my kinsmen, that word kinsmen means fellow Jews. It was the same race. He, these are other Jewish followers of Jesus that are there with Paul, that are encouraging him and helping him. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. It's sort of interesting. It's like, whoa, hold on. I thought you said that Paul wrote the letter. Well, but Paul had a personal secretary uh, to write out what, and he, um, he dictated it. And so all of a sudden we see Tertius who's writing everything down, sort of pop up. It's sort of a, a little bit of a, a, a kick here. And then he goes back into the background. He says, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Um, and so Paul was a part of this house church, and he's there within this church. And Gaius is the place where the church is meeting. And this is, um, and he's giving a greeting. And then Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cordus greets you. Now, I'm pretty sure, I think that, that Paul was writing from the city of Ephesus, many people believe that when he was writing to the Romans, uh, Ephesus was no small city. And, and here, one of the things you see is, is that Erastus, the city treasurer, 
the city's treasurer in, in, a, in a Roman city. He gives greeting. He's a follower of Jesus. The God has raised up right in the middle of the political environment and the political government in the Roman world, which was not the nicest people, a follower of Jesus, who is, by the way, not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation that he puts his name down to a letter that goes throughout all the churches. We're not alone. You're not alone. And I'm oftentimes amazed where, where God raises up people and he puts them in these positions of influence and of, of presence within our, within our school system. We, we have uh, Dr. Edmund Ansala, who is over all education in Eldorado County, devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And we have a number of teachers here within our church. There are a number of other teachers who are part of other churches in our community who are there within our schools who are bringing the presence and the love of Jesus. And within our law enforcement community, there are people who are followers of Jesus. In fact, this morning, I, I want to just sort of highlight one of, one of the followers of Jesus who's a part of our law enforcement community down in Sacramento County, Sacramento County Sheriff. Nate Gergich, who has been a part of um, leading young adults within our ministry, been a part of here, uh, him and his wife, Janae, awesome people. And um, in fact, I, I want to give you a picture of the kind of people that God raises up to be his presence in the community to let people know the love and the power of Jesus. So watch the screen. So, yeah, so isn't it comforting to know that that's who's protecting us in our communities, right? You know, follower of Jesus. By the way, Nate was the, the lighter hue of the two, so um, he was the white guy, all right? So, uh, and hopefully Nate's going to come today in third service. Just don't spoil it for him, all right? So, it's always good to laugh. You are not alone. Jesus is always with you. And there are people that he has placed in your life. And you know what? You are one of those people that Jesus has placed in other people's lives. That we can be people who follow Jesus, his hands and his feet in the world we live. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you love us so, so much. And Jesus, thank you that, that in the confusion and the... Um, of all the things that are going on in our personal life and we're trying to understand life and hope and faith that we can come back to you and live a life of focused on trusting and knowing you. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and help us to be your presence in the world today, in the world this week, wherever you lead us, as a student, as a teacher, as a person within our vocation, within our family, within our community. Lord, help us to be your presence. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And we're going to close in worship. The ushers are going to come forward. Those welcome cards, we asked you to fill out a little bit earlier. If you could put those in there. And if you call Cold Springs Church your home, it's an opportunity for you to be generous as well. You can always do that online or the kiosk as well. So let's stand and let's worship.